Hi everybody, today we're going to learn how to write noble gas configurations and also how to write configurations for ions. We've been doing normal full electron configurations and configurations of neutral atoms, so noble gas configuration is going to be a shortcut method we can use so we don't have to write as much out on our paper and we'll be able to write the configuration for ions which is important because ions are oftentimes involved in making molecules and things. So it'll be good to know how to write their configurations. First, it's really important to remember that this right-hand column is called the noble gases. They have a full shell. We say they have a full valence shell. Their s orbitals and p orbitals are full. When they are full, it's a total of eight valence electrons. So if we have two electrons in an s orbital and we have three p orbitals and they each hold two, you can count it up and all together they have a nice full outer shell of eight. That makes them very stable. They don't like to react with other things. There are people who spend their entire career trying to get them to undergo reactions. It's not easy. They really don't want to do it. They don't want to make themselves worse off. They're already perfect, so why would they change anything? Sometimes you may hear them called inert gases. Inert is just a fancier way of saying that they don't react. The reason they're called noble gases is that it's kind of an allusion to saying like, oh, the nobles, you know, the nobility wouldn't want to interact with anybody just like how the noble gas elements don't want to react with the other elements. All right, so let's look at some examples of these full shells. So helium is our first noble gas. It's the smallest. It's just 1s2. And you can see here that that s orbital is full. Compare that to hydrogen, which was just 1s1. It wasn't full yet. Helium is much more stable because it has that full s orbital. Next comes neon. Neon is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. And you can see here they have a nice full shell of s and p orbitals in this second energy level. It's not that we're looking for the last orbital set to be full. We're looking for this S and P set to be full together. Here's argon. So you can see here the highest energy level is level 3. And in this highest energy level, the S and P orbitals are full. So that makes it very stable, makes it a noble gas. Next comes krypton. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p6. So if you look here, the highest energy level is energy level 4. And the s orbitals are full, and the p orbitals there are full. We don't so much care about these d orbitals because they're in a lower energy level, right? Energy level 4 is the one that's on the outside, so that's its valence. It's okay that the 4D and 4F are not full. Remember, those are so strange and funky. Elements don't really care as much about those. The S and P is kind of what we're looking at for, for our purposes here. Last, let's look at xenon. Here you can see energy level 5 is the highest energy level in terms of distance from the nucleus, right? It's the one that's on the outside, and its s and p orbitals are full. One thing you have to really train your brain to be careful of is not mix up the difference between energy level, meaning distance from the nucleus, and the energy that it takes to fill the orbitals. The order that we fill these orbitals up in is not necessarily the same order that the energy levels go in. See our d orbitals, we wait and fill those later, same with f orbitals. 
they're still in energy level three. They just get filled a little bit later on because they take a little bit more energy to occupy. So be careful when you're looking at these configurations that if we ask for the valence shell, we're talking about the highest energy level, meaning distance from the nucleus. Okay. So writing a noble gas configuration is going to be a shortcut. And what we're going to do is we're basically going to use the fact that these noble gases are special and they're extra stable and everything wants to look like a noble gas. So what we're going to do is we're going to shrink the first part of the configuration down so that it matches the closest noble gas. And we're going to put all of that in brackets and just write the symbol instead. Then anything that comes after that noble gas, we're going to write like a normal configuration. So the idea is we're basically going to take the whole front half of our configuration and shrink it down to a noble gas inside some brackets. And what that's going to tell people is this element looks just like this noble gas here, except for some extra stuff that comes later. Okay. So let's look at some examples to see how this works. Let's do lithium. So the closest noble gas to lithium is helium. Here is lithium's configuration. Here is helium's configuration. We can see that they're almost the same. This part matches. This part looks just like helium, but then we got a little bit of extra stuff that came afterwards. So what we're going to do is instead of writing 1s2, we're just going to put helium's symbol inside brackets. And then we're going to write the extra part outside of the brackets. So this is saying that lithium's configuration is just like helium's, except we have a little bit extra. So let's look at nitrogen. The previous noble gas is still helium. I know that there's one that's closer, okay? I know that neon is a little bit closer, but we're going to the previous one. We have not gotten to neon yet. We don't have enough electrons to look like neon yet. Okay, so we have to go to the one that comes before it. So helium comes before nitrogen. Here's nitrogen's configuration. And if you look, this part matches. And then we have some extra. So that's what we do. We write helium in brackets and then we write the extra on the outside. If this is sodium, the noble gas that comes before sodium is neon. Here's sodium's configuration. If you look, the whole first, you know, three parts of it match. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6 match. So instead of having to write all of this, we're just going to write neon in brackets plus a little bit extra. Okay. So this can really, really help you, you know, on something like lithium, this doesn't seem like much of a shortcut, but when they get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, hopefully you can see that this makes our configurations much, much shorter. So this is noble gas configurations. All right, let's do some bigger ones, okay? Let's do iron. Look at your periodic table and try to see what the previous noble gas is. Not necessarily the closest, but the one that comes before it. The previous noble gas is argon. 
if I have irons configuration, it looks like this. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d6. If we look at argon, argon ends in 3p6. So this whole first part is the same as argon. So instead of having to write all of this, I'm just going to put argon in brackets, and then I'm going to add this extra bit to the end. So I say argon in brackets, and then 4s2, 3d6. All right, you try barium. Find the previous noble gas first. The previous noble gas was xenon. Barium's a pretty big element. It has 56 electrons. Try to write out the whole configuration first like we've been doing. You get all of that. Now find xenon. Xenon ends in 5p6. So this whole front part matches xenon. So what I get to write instead is just that, nice and short. You can see how much faster this would be. This really only works if you understand that you know we're going to the previous noble gas because it's nice and stable and full and we're just trying to tell people the extra that comes after that last stable position. Okay Krypton, try this one start to finish. You can pause the video if you like. Okay, the previous noble gas was argon. The configuration for krypton ends in 4p6. The configuration for argon ended in 3p6. So it's argon plus some extra, and I get that. Now, on this one, everybody wants to say, can't I just put krypton in brackets and be done? No, because the whole point of a noble gas configuration is to describe the electrons that are coming after the previous stable position. So argon was our last stable, stable element, right? Our last noble gas. This is the piece, these things here are what make it different make krypton different than argon. If you just put krypton in brackets, you're not comparing it to anything. And a noble gas configuration is meant to draw your attention to the pieces that are different from the last noble gas. So you unfortunately can't just, you know, put krypton in brackets. The nice thing is though, that means it will always just be the previous noble gas plus your extra, even if it's a noble gas itself go to the one that came before. Okay. All right, switching gears a little bit, configuration of ions. Hopefully some of this is going to be review. You know, if it's review, you can jot down a couple reminders, but you should probably have some of this in your notes already. Remember an ion is something that has a charge we have changed the number of electrons that it normally comes with. So normal circumstances, if it's neutral, protons equals electrons, and there would be no charge. If it's an ion, this is no longer true. I've either taken electrons away, or I've added more electrons. I'm not changing the protons. Okay, we can't do that without a nuclear reaction, and we are for sure not doing that, right? We're only changing electrons. 
The reason why things make ions is because they're trying to become stable. And if they want to be stable, they want their electrons to look like a noble gas. They want to have a full S and P orbital set. Okay, it's important that if I ask you why we make ions, I don't want you to stop at this kind of, you know, oh, they want to look like a noble gas. Give me a little bit more than that. You could say they want their electron configuration to look like a noble gas. You could say that they want to have a full S and P set to look like a noble gas. Okay, they want to have that full shell so that they have the stability of a noble gas. Okay, give me a little bit more than just this first line. So, just a quick refresher. We have cations and anions. Cation has lost electrons. So now there's more protons than electrons. Which is going to result in things not canceling out properly, so we end up with some extra positive charge on that atom. Anions gain electrons, so now we have too many. They don't cancel out perfectly, and we get a minus charge. The thing we're going to learn now is how do you know how many electrons you're going to lose or gain. And the way you're going to do that is you're going to look for the closest noble gas. Then you adjust the number of electrons until you look like the closest one. This is somewhere where people get a little bit mixed up sometimes. You have to be careful because on a noble gas configuration, you're using it based off of the previous noble gas. When we're looking to see what charge to make, you have to look at the closest noble gas. That may be the previous one, it may be the next one. You have to count and you have to actually look to see which one is closer. So for example, we have lithium. Lithium has three electrons. The previous noble gas has two, and the next noble gas has 10. So lithium is gonna you know, realize that it's a lot easier to lose one electron and look like helium than to try to go steal seven more to look like neon. Where is it going to find seven atoms willing to give away an electron? Or where is it going to find a couple atoms willing to give away maybe one or two or three at a time? It's not going to have an easy time doing that. So because helium is closer, lithium is just going to give away an extra. It's going to lose an electron. That way it looks like helium. If we lose an electron, the result is a positive charge we have lost a negative object, which leads us to have an imbalance of charge and we're left with a little bit of extra that was not extra positive that was not canceled out. Calcium has 20 electrons. Our previous noble gas had 18. The next noble gas has 36. Argon is definitely closer. So it's going to lose two electrons to look like argon. It's losing two negatively charged objects. So some of the protons are not canceled out and we get a plus two charge. Phosphorus has 15 electrons. Previous noble gas has 10. The next noble gas has 18. This time, the next noble gas is closer. Argon is closer. So instead of trying to lose five electrons, all it has to do is gain three. So that will be an easier thing to do. So it will gain three electrons and it will look like argon. When it has three extra negative objects, that results in a minus three charge. There are not enough protons there to cancel out those new electrons. 
Remember that the D block gets a little bit weird, the F block as well. They can do lots of crazy things, okay? When we labeled our periodic table, we labeled up at the top the charges that the normal S and P block like to make. Those ones have a very nice pattern. All right. Sometimes things get strange when we start taking electrons away. Because we have to remove from the highest energy level, we may not be removing in the same order that we filled the orbitals in. It's a little bit strange. There's actually um, a lot of research that kind of indicates this may not actually be true. As of now, this is still what they ask us to teach you. But I would not be surprised if in the next, you know, five, ten years I have to adopt this PowerPoint, okay? So be careful if you start trying to look stuff up online. Um, things get pretty complicated pretty fast, okay? So for the purposes of this being a high school level chemistry class, going off of the list of what they've decided I teach you, we're going to say that you always remove from the highest energy level and that may not be the same order that we filled them in, okay? One of the big reasons this um, is often thought to be true is that because once you've put electrons into their orbitals, all their energy levels and things can adjust a little bit. So there are a lot of exceptions. That D and F block gets really, really weird because of this. So, you know, we're not going to worry too much about all this, all the circumstances where this may not apply. Just learn the general rule, and it shows that you kind of have the general concept, which is plenty appropriate for a high school level class. So let's look at some examples. We'll start with a small atom, an easy one. We'll look at lithium. So for lithium, the highest energy level is level 2. So that's the electron we're going to lose first. So to go from lithium, which is neutral, to lithium plus one, we're going to lose this electron. The nice thing is, now it looks just like helium. Next, let's look at calcium. If we look here, the highest energy level is level four. So that's what we're going to lose first. If we get rid of that, we drop down to a full S and P shell, don't we? The next level is level three, and this is full, so it looks just like argon. Much more stable. So, D block. These are called transition metals. They do lots of strange things. They can make lots of different charges. Sometimes you'll hear people call them variable charges, meaning depending on the circumstances, they can lose one electron or two or three or four or five. Okay, they can do lots of different things. You have to be given a little bit more information. They will lose electrons. They are metals. Okay, it's always going to work out better for them configuration-wise to lose the electrons. That's always what's going to be easier for them to do. So they will always make cations. So that's one thing you don't have to really think about. You can always just assume they're going to make a plus charge. So let's look at copper. If we look at copper, our configuration ends in 3D9 inside that D block, a transition block. But this is not the highest energy level. This was the hardest orbital to fill. This is the orbital that took the most energy to fill, but that's not the furthest from the nucleus. The ones that are furthest from the nucleus are right here, energy level four. So if I want to make copper plus one, I need to take an electron away from this orbital here. This is still the furthest from the nucleus. And if you think about it, 
we're going to remove electrons from the outside orbital, the one that's furthest from the nucleus, because that's what another atom is going to bump into, right? The joke is that atoms are shallow. They only care about what's on the outside. So we want to see which electrons are furthest on the outside. That doesn't mean they were harder to fill. It doesn't mean it didn't take more energy. These, these ones here took more energy to, to occupy these orbitals, but these are further from the nucleus. So copper plus one is gonna look almost normal until you see right here, right? It lost an electron. One of the things that's hard is that people will just take it from the last one and you can't. If there are um, D or F orbitals involved, you need to be a little bit careful, okay? I would write some kind of big, giant note in your notebook about that. All right. Let's look at copper two. Well, energy level four is still the highest. We're still going to take electrons from there first. So now look what happens. This whole section goes away. If I'm trying to lose two electrons, it shrinks it down. And it's still going to end in 3D9, but we don't even have a 4S anymore. It's kind of collapsed, right? It's not there. So be careful that you're not on autopilot and you don't put it in there on accident. Okay. Once again, be very careful. So, to kind of summarize, no matter what, take the electrons from the highest energy level, the one that is furthest from the nucleus. You'll take from that P orbital set, if it exists, then from the S orbitals, and only then will you come back and take from that lower D orbital set if needed. So it's really important that you remember we may not remove electrons in the same order they are filled. I tell people every single year that I'm going to give them a quiz or a test question about the configuration of ions where you have to be careful about which orbitals you remove them from. And people know that, they're told it, they study it, they take the quiz or the test, they're going so fast, they're on autopilot, and they forget that they have to be careful, and they don't check to see which orbital they're taking away from, and it ends up one of the most missed questions every year. And then when people see their results, they think, oh shoot, I knew it, I just forgot. But that's the thing, we cannot forget, okay? We have to make sure that we know our material well enough that it is so ingrained in our heads that we take away from the highest energy level first that you don't make that mistake, okay? Let's do one that's going to have um, a few more steps, a few more ions being made so you can see this pattern happening, okay? So let's do gallium. It's element 31. Here's its configuration. If I want to make gallium plus one, I'm going to take away this 4p electron first. Because energy level four is the highest, I take from the p orbitals first. So take that away, and it shrinks down to this. Better than it was but it could still do a little bit better losing some more electrons. It'd be a little bit happier. So let's go to gallium plus two. I leave the 3D alone. Energy level three is closer to the nucleus. I need to take one from here, from 4S. I take one of those away and one is still behind. We still have one left behind. Better than it used to be but let's keep going. Let's go to gallium three plus. We're gonna take this last 4S electron away and it shrinks down and you kind of collapse it down. 
I personally like underlining when that happens to draw people's attention to it. It is not required. It's not like a standard thing. I, I don't really know if other teachers even do that, but I like to show you with an underline that is kind of collapsed a little bit, okay? Otherwise, it's easy to not even notice that this is missing. On a quiz and a test, we're not gonna underline it like this. We wanna see if you remember to check your answer choices and to look carefully at them, okay? Let's go one step further. Let's say that whatever is happening in this reaction is gonna make a gallium four plus ion. Well, there are no more energy level fours to take from, they're all gone. So now the next lowest is energy level three again. Now is the first time I can finally take one of these D electrons away. So I take one of them away, and now it ends in 3D9. I would have to take nine more electrons away, then I would take these six electrons, then I would take these two electrons, right? You'd have to go a long way before you started getting to the next shell down to energy level two. It's never gonna lose that many electrons, okay? So you can kind of see, we start by taking the obvious one, then it gets a little less obvious, we have to take it from in here, then finally down here, we can start taking it from that D set, okay? All right, that's it. I hope that was helpful. Hopefully you're happy that you can sometimes use noble gas configurations and save yourself some time. Now you can kind of use your configurations to predict which ions might be made, and that's gonna be very useful in letting us start making molecules. And once we know what molecules we can build, we can start putting them together to make reactions, and that's when we can start making stuff in chemistry. And it all starts with these electron configurations. All right, hope that was helpful. Bye, everybody.